everybody, Larry Lawton here. I have a great video today. I have two great influencers with me. I have JD Daly and I have my man Ian Bick. Yeah, what's and up? we did some great stuff. Before I get started on the show, please check us out. YouTube member programs, Discord, Patreon, the book, Gangster Redemption, does very well. The cigars. This is a box that I gave to my good friends. We've been doing content for a few days and we've been having a lot of fun. Now I get to ask you guys some questions. And here's why, everybody. I went to prison in 1996. J JD went to prison in 2006. And Ian went to prison in 2016. So we are 10 years apart. And I'm going to ask you guys a few questions about what it was like in the years we went. Because a lot of people want to know about that. And I think it's going to be a great show. First of all, I'm going to go one to you, JD, and then you, uh, Ian. Keep answers or what they are and have fun with them and if if you think things are different let's talk about that first of all jd what did you go to prison for i went to prison for uumv times three and uumv is oregon's version of grand theft auto i stole a lot of cars i had some russians in portland i would steal cars take them to them they were taking them and putting them on boats and sending them directly back home um so you know i was making a pretty decent amount of money doing it and Oregon let me rack up three of them because they only give you 13 months on each one. So you went to prison for robbing cars. I mean, I was robbing cars back in the fucking 70s. Yeah, I was stealing. I, w I would steal anywhere from four to 12 cars a night. Oh, and, oh you, you're a big time. We were stealing one or two, getting 500 bucks, sending them to chop shops. Yeah. And, and then do it. Ian, what did you go to prison for? Uh, I went to prison for wire fraud, money laundering, and while well, I was charged with making a false statement to federal postal officers, but I won that charge in court. I love that charge because I was charged with it six years after I was in prison, filing a false statement, 18 USC. They hit everyone with that. Yeah, well, I don't know. I was six years in when they hit me, 18 USC 1001. Okay, let's get into our crimes a little bit. JD, when you went to prison, in 2006, what was it like? I mean, was it was did you have cell phones? Did you have uh, uh, visitations? What was it like there? So when I went into prison, like what was going on on the streets was flip phones still. Like I got out, everybody had iPhones. I went in, people had flip phones. So we had like every prison that I went to, there were a couple of cell phones that you know were brought in directly by COs, but we were mainly using them to arrange drops, arrange payments, arrange you know paying COs in for the bringing prison. stuff in. Yeah. Um, so you know what, what you're saying when I, when you went to prison. Uh, when I was in prison, and if you got a caught with a cell phone, it was an escape charge. Same, same. Okay. They were handing out five years for it. Wow. Ian, you went to prison <laughs> in 2016. I did, yeah. What was it like? First of all, did you ever get caught with a cell phone? So I personally never got caught with one. I got like roped up in an investigation because I was like on a video in the cell phone because all these guys like they're going live like it's it's like a party new year's eve in federal prison in 2016 like everyone's going live on snapchat on instagram on facebook they're facetiming their their girls it's it's wild now, doesn't the prison know this i mean i think they do but i mean so fort dix is probably one of the well it's like one of the biggest federal prisons in the country but it's also one of the biggest ones for like corruption and contraband now and fort dix let's get the audience straight Fort Dix is a, a camp and low facility yep. with approximately 7,500 prisoners, 5,000 in the lows. Yeah, and then I think so. another 500 or so in the camp. Okay, so you're talking about 4,000 inmates, so, give or take. Like 6,000, I would say. Wow, yeah, 6,000 inmates. Yeah. And they're all in Fort Dix. And Fort Dix is in New Jersey. It's an army base. It's an old army barracks. There's two sides to the compound. You're housed in old barracks. It's 12-man rooms, six bunk beds, big table. There's no locks on the doors. Just the unit itself is locked, and the unit's three floors. The bottom floor, you have a pool hall. You have a little microwave room. You got a TV room. And then the second and third floor, there's two bathrooms on each floor. Showers. It's old, old brick. Like, it's disgusting, the bathrooms. They're not, like, clean or well, whatever. It, it, you know, as a man who comes from a penitentiary. Oh, this is way different. This <laughs> is like, what the fuck am this I talking is, about? I'm like, oh, whoa. This I mean, is summer camp, you know? This I is mean, crazy summer camp. It's funny, Ian, because I actually drove through Fort Dix on a bus in a black box, dropping guys off. And I'm like, please let me make a mistake. Let me over this prison, <laughs> you know, but obviously they didn't do that. 
So we're going to go. So, J.D., at what age did you go to prison? So, uh, let's see. I was 25, 26. You were 25, 26. Ian, at what I was, age? I was 21. I just turned 21. 21. And I went to prison at 34 years old. You old bastard. Yeah, yeah that I was. <laughs> I ended up doing four 12-year sentences, and I got out at 46 years old. What age did you get out at, J.D.? So I got out at 30 years old. I turned 30 in prison. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And Ian? Got out. I think I just turned 24, or I was about to turn 24. Okay. Now, here's a question I think audiences want to know. Uh, when I got out, I was 46 years old. You were 30-ish, and you were about 25, give or take. 24, 18, yeah. 24, 24. 25. What was it like, Ian, for you first, what did the society, what did your community, your parents, and everybody think of your charge? Like, were you looked down on? You were a fraudster, so did people look, oh, the guy's, you know, look at him, he's a fucking fraudster, he just got out of prison. What was it like? I think with my case, it's very divided because I came from, like, a smaller town, like, there's 100,000 people, it's not a big town, and... And you were known as the whiz kid. Yeah, so I, I, I was known because I was running this famous club that was famous before I was even ever old enough to drink. You know, it was, it was, it was legendary. And then when I took it over, that became legendary. So I was always in the papers. I was super well known. And I think the town was just divided on whether there's two parts to it. One, there's the half that say, well, you know, people should never have invested in a kid that much money. You have that half. Kind of what I say, and then you, and then and then you have those same people that are, realize it wasn't intentional and that it just got too big too quickly and that there was no guidance. So there's that half, and then there's the half that read and take everything that's said in the papers and they'll read like everything word for word that the prosecutors say. They everything it. they believe it, they think of like scum of the earth, and that's just like how it is now too. That's like that with social media. Like if you if you look up articles or whatever they're gonna go like that and i would say it's still the same way now like i'll run into people that don't like me but i also run into people that fully support me and they love the comeback they love the redemption they love what i was able to do before do you get snide remarks you ever been out at a store or or, or at, like myself i'll sometimes get recognized at, a lot of times at airports and stuff and sometimes i wonder what they're thinking you know <laughs> oh, he was the criminal he was the bad guy he was the guy oh fuck that guy's robbed a lot of money or whatever it was do you get snide remarks? This is actually a funny story. So like the last few years, never had any run. Like I've, I've seen people that, cause I've always read comments and seen what people post. So like I would always run into people that I knew from high school. And a lot of those people would talk shit publicly on Facebook or whatever when the articles came out. But then when they saw me, they'd come up to me and said, great job, love what you're doing, this and that, whatever. But then it's funny you bring it up because last week I'm at the car wash and this is my first ever like bad in-person interaction with anyone. I'm at the car wash and this guy that I knew from the nightclub days, he had worked for me as like an MC, helped like renovate it or whatever. He was never an investor or anything. I don't owe him any money, nothing like that. And he sees me at the car wash. He's like, yo, Ian, what's up? You remember me? And I look at him. I'm like, yeah, I remember you. I go up, you know, give him a dap up, a hug, whatever. Everything's cool. We're talking, catch it up. I said, what are you doing? He said, he's an actor now. He was just in this movie, this and that. Great. Everything's good. All of a sudden the conversation shifts like in the matter of seconds. And he looks at me and he's like, so do you feel bad about what you did? And I'm like, yeah, of course I feel bad. Like, you know, we were young, mistakes happen, mistakes were made. Now you got to keep in mind, this happened like going on almost 12 years ago now. This is a long time ago. And he's, he's like goes on this rant about like God and saying like I affected people's lives and that he knew personally people that lost every, like this, this whole rant. He made it seem like I took like grandparents' life savings and that they were out You're on the street. Bernie Madoff over here. Yeah, <laughs> that's what he did. And he gets up close in my face like he's trying to start like a fight or something. And he's instigating this. And this is at the car wash. And he's going on. He's like, dude, you, you fuck so many people, this and that. And um, just all the stuff. He's like, I didn't watch your fucking HBO Max documentary. They never should have made a documentary about you. And what I like thinking about it after when I had time to reflect on it because I looked at his social media pages and stuff, I think a lot of this anger came from maybe like a jealousy factor or something because like he's a struggling actor or whatever it is and he's looking at my social media and I have a platform or whatever, whatever it was. So he walks away, I, I walk away and I say, 
dude, whatever. I'm not going to get into this. I'm not going to get into a fight with someone. Like, I have too much going on. So I walk away. And this is a car wash where you don't sit in the car to go through it. You, like, walk through the building. He sat in his car and went through the car wash. He goes to the other end of the car wash. I'm inside. I get out. His car pulls up. My car's in front of his. He gets out. And then he comes up, and he's like, you're a fucking bitch. Like, I hope you um, uh, have fun working at Whole Foods the rest of your life. Like, all this shit. And then drives off. It was, it was the weirdest interaction ever. I have not seen this guy in over 10 years. And that was like my first and only bad interaction in the four years that I've been out. And this guy's also not, like I could understand if he was an investor and owed money. You had no dealings with him in this business at we, all. We had dealings back in the day, but he, I don't owe him money, whatever, you know? Well, you're going to get that in life. JD, now you went away as being a pretty big fraudster. I mean, you, identity theft. You stole identities. You stole a bunch of stuff. You were also a meth dealer, correct? Yes. Uh, my, and, my you know, last... I mean, you, you, your, your resume is pretty big, J.D. Kind of like me a little bit. I have an extensive resume. My last bust was for organized fraud and counterfeiting. Then they hit me with another charge for a uh, basically breaking into a car. That came like 30 days after I paid my bond. Then the, secret, or the SWAT team came back to my house to... Uh, pick me up on a sales of meth within a thousand feet of a school, which sounds super creepy. I was in a, a Hilton, like on the second floor in a suite. Yeah, and but there a were dude, a bunch of kids. Right, and a dude floor, came right? to my a dude came to my room uh, to do a controlled buy. Um, but they said that there was uh, some sort of private school within a thousand feet from this Hilton, which turned out to be a thousand and forty four feet. I paid a private forensic investigator to go and measure it, so I was able to take get that within a thousand feet of a school. Okay, I was let, like, let's stop that, Not that. When you got out of prison. Yeah. Now, you were known a lot of things. You, you I got to commend you for, for helping people what you do now with, with help with addiction issues and stuff of that nature. When you got out, did people look at you like, oh, look at this fucking guy. He's a criminal. Fucker, what is he doing? Within a few months of getting out, I had a really good job with the county. Uh, working for the you county for parks the department. County. Yeah, I worked for the county parks department. I ran <laughs> one of the largest parks in Lane County, Oregon, um, and I had I had a caretaker house inside this giant park, like this hundred acre. You're park. a felon, and you get this job? Absolutely. Uh, what am I've, I missing here? I have always what a fucking resume. I'm a felon. Can I have a job? He didn't work okay. for the mob. I've always <laughs> taken things really head on and been fully transparent. I'll, I'll go in if I'm trying to get an opportunity, whether it be housing, whether it be employment, I go in and I tell them straight up, like, you know, I've made mistakes. These are what my mistakes are. This is what I've done to correct that. And I'm doing really well right now. If this is a deal breaker, please tell me right now, because I don't want to waste your time and I'm definitely not here to waste mine. And I look people in the eye and I think that they can see that, you know, where I'm coming from. So I had that opportunity. And but did you have people that you either frauded or sold drugs to or something? Look at that, oh, fuck, you know, snide. I call it snide remarks. Like, you know, like I've had a person come up to me actually and say, you know, yeah, but you were a real criminal. You robbed people's jewelry. How about the people that were, you know, had their engagement rings at that place and you robbed them and stuff? Made me think. How many people did I fuck over and stuff? Now, I never literally took a ring off a person's finger or something, but if there was there, it was in the store, it was kind of like, you know, fair game. People don't say that type of stuff to my face. I get a lot of it on the well, internet. I wouldn't either, man. Look at you. You know what I'm fucking saying? fucking animal. But like, <laughs> I'm, I'm painfully, painfully fucking aware of the negative consequences you got for a heart, others Katie. and the things that I did. And like, when I was doing fraud, let's just be really clear. When I was doing fraud, I wasn't doing fraud against like private citizens or anything like that. I went directly after pharmaceutical companies, reps, uh, credit card numbers that I found on the dark web and I bought them and I would create fake credit cards off fake people that didn't exist. I would make IDs for them. So in my mind, I justified it. You know, I'm in, I'm high on meth and everything. And I'm thinking this is a victimless crime because f fuck the pharmaceutical companies, JD, but it was just I justification you because you justified everything I do. I never hurt somebody who wasn't in my business. Yeah. I heard a lot of people. I was a physical guy, laid guys' arms on curves and snapped them. And I said, well, that guy fucking owed money to us. Or that guy was involved in a drug trade in my area. That guy robbed from a drug, you know, I, I tortured somebody with an iron. 
And I talk about that in my book, Gangster Redemption, about torturing a man with an iron. But in my own way, I justify it because he was involved in the crime business. He robs from a drug dealer or, or a, a bookmaker or my boss. So, I mean, I justify it, not saying right or wrong. Obviously, I'm not judging you at all. I never would. I want to stop real quick because, like, I was, I was, you had mentioned the fraud and the victims of my fraud. And I really wanted to get down to the point of where I really feel fucking awful in my soul about is where I took people's cars because that could affect their job, their ability to feed their family, you know, their just all Wait the way down that, the line. That really affected you, JJ's cars. I stole more fucking cars than my, probably most people ever. <laughs> think yeah, about insurance. this. Think, think about this, though. Yeah, fucking insurance. Think, they, the most people probably liked it. Do you know how long it takes for insurance to pay people back for their cars? Like, imagine walking out to go to your shitty fucking job so that you can pay for your kids' fucking food and you know, the gone. rent, and your fucking car is not there. And then good, you, you you're call. off for the day. You, you call. call your insurance company, and you're making money. JJ. You call your boss and you're like hey man my car's not here i'm not gonna make it to work and they're like yeah that doesn't really work for me fuck you you're fired like i i i can i have concerns can I stop about you, that jd because yeah. you, you you're really digging in of the worst of the worst of the worst listen i often think about listen larry lawton when i robbed the jewelry store i wiped them out these fucking people had not a fucking jewel they were gone but did you know when I ended up going to uh, uh, sentencing, they couldn't get people to testify against me because these people put insurance claims in for $1.2 million when it lost 800000 or whatever it was. So everybody made a little money. And I, trust me, I'm not knocking them. You're looking into your crimes in a deep, deep way. And I, I hope you don't do that to, to kill yourself because, yes, you can go... Oh my God, I robbed somebody. So every time they look at fucking somebody who's bald and they got a, a fucking head or whatever I was at the time, oh, they're going to have a traumatic experience. You can get so deep into your own crime, your own problem. I hope people get over them. We, we're not proud of what we did. I know, they want, I know you mean that. And even like the, 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 let's just flip the switch. Guy get a fucking car, you rob the car, you don't make it dirt. All of a sudden, the fucking guy loses his job and he gets a better job. And any fucking guy gets insurance money that was worth more than the car. Now you just help that guy in a way that, you know, we all don't know. Because a lot of times when one door closes, another door opens, sometimes for the better. So I don't like for you to take yourself and say, oh, I was bad. because Listen, you were bad because you committed a crime. You did what you did. But J.D., your heart is in the right spot. And I think that's And I important. understand that we never will see, like, there. it's, with me, anytime I got convicted of stealing a car, they told me I was not allowed to contact the victim. And everybody's always like, did you go make it right with the victim? I can't, bitch, that's a judge AA told me bullshit. not to. You know that's what I'm a, saying? Listen, let, let's get AA bullshit. Make it right for the victim. Go fuck yourself. Make it right for the victim. The victim got his insurance. Listen, I robbed a lot of money. Make it right. What well, make it right? Give me ten grand. You fucking made another thirty, fifty grand on the, on the side because you did the insurance job. I'm not even saying that. Listen, we can go deep into our crimes and do that, but I'm yeah. not going to do that. I want to go for ages. One more quick couple of questions. Did any of you have children? I didn't. JD did. Right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. How how did that hit you, JD? It was it was fucking terrible. Um, the first time I so I didn't want my son to see me at a maximum security penitentiary. Like it was a bad environment. The visiting room was fucked. I was behind glass for two years on my visits because I got a dirty UA. So when I finally got to minimum <laughs> and I could have contact visits, I finally got a visit with my son for the first time in multiple years. He walked in the visiting room and I saw him scanning the room looking for me he looked dead at me and then kept looking because he didn't even recognize wow. me because it had been so fucking long yeah. man. and i just realized like man that's on me you know ian i want to say i'm glad you don't have you know i mean that that's something you didn't have to go through uh when i went away my daughter was 15 months old i got out and she was 13. when you got out of prison out now you're free you did your time you just were in the feds you did some hard time and it's hard, no matter what you look at. I don't care what level you're at. Told what to do, when to go, when to get up. You've been on Con Air. You've been in a lot of places. When you got out of prison, what was it like? What was changed that 
really shocked you? I think the biggest thing was smart TVs. There wasn't like smart TVs before I went in. And then like when I got out, everything was like on one TV and you didn't need like a box anymore. And it's like Wi-Fi. I'm like, holy shit, you could search on YouTube on this TV. This is sick. <laughs> and then obviously there was like four different new iPhones that came out. But I would say that was like the biggest thing like technologically. But otherwise, like everything else, like life just keeps going. You know, yeah. it doesn't like really stop. And it wasn't like somewhere where like you, you did like 10 years and a lot could change, like buildings change, stuff years. like that. <laughs> yeah. So like for me, maybe a couple pizza places went out of business, this and that, but nothing like major, you know? But, but it was something technology. JD, yeah. Cell phones. you got out in 2006. Yeah. Now. No, I went in in 2006. in 2006. When did you get out? I got out uh, 2010. Okay, you got to include that. What shocked you? And what changed? What was the big change for you? Cell phones, everything went from flip phones. People had just started texting, but to even hit the S, you had to hit the button multiple times. I get Three out. Times. I get out. Everything's touch screens. Everybody has a fucking video camera on their phone. Everybody's texting. Their social media. It was wild. That and strippers bleaching their buttholes. That was oh, new technology. I love that. But, you know, I want to thank both of you guys for coming on the show. Thanks for having and, us, man. And, and talking to me about the stuff that we went through as different years. Listen, I look at both of you guys now as friends, as, as comrades, or guys who've been through what we've been through. And you guys are great guys. You guys work hard. You do want the best for most people. And you know, and this is what it's, we also have to have fun. And and I got to say, I want to thank both of you for having me up in New York. Mm -hmm. And we're we're in again Q29 Studios, Q29 Production. Great guys, they really are. If you want to look them up, if you want a podcast in any area, wherever you're at, just check them out, uh, Q29. You can check them out in productions, call them, and they can work from you from around the world. They're really good guys. They got all the technology. They know what they're doing. They can help you with Facebook. They can. You know, <laughs> they can help you with Facebook and a few things more. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. But you guys, I want to thank you both. JD, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Larry. Ian, it's been a blast today. Thank you, Thanks for having and me. And I'll see you back in Florida. Yes, you will, JD. You, you live next to me. We're going to be doing some content. We're neighbors, Ian, brother. you're welcome. Anytime. I'm coming soon. Please. I want that uh, roast beef sandwich and the it. nachos. Anytime you want it, you got it. Everybody, thank you. Please make good choices. Don't do what I did. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.